Hello, I'm Anna Raimondi, coming to you from the Angel Cooperative in Ridgefield, Connecticut, with this episode of Talking to the Dead in Suburbia. I am so happy to introduce my guest today, Paul Perry. Hi, Paul. Hi, Anna. How are you? I didn't know you were in Ridgefield. We, uh, we used to live in Terrytown. I live in Arizona now, but we used to live in Terrytown. We almost moved to Ridgefield. Oh, it's a nice so, I'm, I actually live in a neighboring town, but all these yeah. towns up here are really very nice. Good place They're to great. raise children. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, Paul Perry children. is the co-author of several New York Times bestsellers, including Evidence of the Afterlife, Closer to the Light, Transformed by the Light, and Saved by the Light, which was made into a popular movie by Fox. It's pretty impressive. His books have been published in more than 30 languages around the world and cover a wide variety of subjects from near-death experiences to biographies of authors. He is also a documentary filmmaker and owns his own production company. In 2001, only weeks after the attack on the World Trade Center in New York, Perry went to Egypt to follow the trail of Jesus after which he wrote Jesus in Egypt. He followed that film with Jesus the Lost Years and then his film Visions and Miracles out of the land of Egypt, which contains never before seen footage of visions and miracles that have taken place in modern day Egypt, including Marian apparitions near Cairo that tens of thousands of people have witnessed. I find this all, I find this whole Egyptian journey of yours completely fascinating. It is fascinating, actually. You, you want to talk about that for a minute? Sure. Or do you want to go on? Uh, no. Years ago, I, I went to Egypt, it was in the 90s, to do a documentary film about the stone temples of the Nile. And uh, that's, that's not stone temples of denial. It's stone temples of the Nile. And we, you know, we had flown from the U.S., which is always an arduous journey. And we we got to Egypt and went up river to, uh, 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 you know, the places where there's these really enormous, beautiful temples. And on the boat, we're on the boat, and I was still looking out across the desert. And there's three guys riding with uh, on camels with flowing robes. And I immediately thought about the three wise men. And, and I knew from what little I had read in the Bible, because I'm really not a Bible thumper, uh, I read that Jesus had been to Egypt and as a child, but there's not much in the Bible about what he did when he was there. So we got to the next town and we were going down the Nile town by town. And I started asking people if they knew of any stories about Jesus in Egypt. And whether they were Muslim or Christian, they all had stories and they knew the places the stories had taken place. And I started writing them down on a map. And then about, I did, I continued to study this for five years. And uh, at the end of five years, I was able to make contact with uh, Pope Shenouda, who's the Pope of uh, uh, Coptic Egyptian Christians. And I talked to him about what I wanted to do. And he gave me a map, an entire map of all the sites that they believe, Muslims and Christians both, believe that Jesus and the Holy Family visited when they came to Egypt to, to get away from the soldiers of Herod. And that was the genesis of that book. I, I uh, started on the border with Israel and went all the way down halfway into Egypt to an area called Asut and visited all the temples and, and read all the uh, apocryphal gospels, gospels and stories about Jesus that didn't make it into the Bible. And those are, can be found in the Quran. And uh, in fact, there's more stories in the Quran about the Holy Family and Jesus than there are in the Bible. Yeah. And we placed those in Egypt and we had other stories from apocryphal gospels. And that's what I followed. It's called the Holy Family Trail. And uh, I followed that, took two months. And then uh, the book came out and I was approached by a producer for uh, uh, National Geographic who wanted me to go back and make a film. So I went back and made the film. And uh, both are available. One, uh, the book is called Jesus in Egypt, and uh, they can be found on Glimpses of Eternity, which is uh, uh, my bookshelf on my uh, So website. what do you, in, in hindsight, 
What do you think yeah. led you to this journey? Well, I, I think Jesus alone being, he's might easily, he could easily be the most influential person in world history. And, but there's very little known about him. I mean, he, he went to Egypt when he was possibly two years old or less. And then if you, five or six verses later, this is, this is told in Matthew, that he went there at this time. And that five or six verses later, he, uh, his father sees a vision of Mary. She, he sees a vision of an angel, actually, in a suit. And the angel tells him that they can go back to Israel now. King Herod had died. So those the the space in those five verses is about seven seven years, and uh, uh, so I know that there's seven years of information that's not in the Bible. Then there's nothing after that until he's twelve years old, and then there's only a couple verses that cover a single day when he's found in the temple in Bethlehem, and uh, and he's in there you know, lecturing uh, uh, priests and the like, and as a child. And then there's nothing more in the Bible from the age of 12 till the age of uh, 30. So he gets baptized think, by John. Do you think your quest was more of an intellectual academic pursuit or some kind of divine inspiration to bring this to the world? Well, it's funny because it was initially like a historical pursuit. But then when you get on the trail, you realize that there's a number of, of spiritual things that have happened there. And, uh, and that continued to drive me uh, along the trail. For example, there, were, there was a vision that took place. There were visions that took place in 1968 in a suburb of Cairo called Zaitun. And uh, it wasn't one or two guys that saw the visions. It, was, it, it began with two guys who who ran the parking lot across the street. And they looked up and they saw this woman standing on the top of this church in Zaitun. And they thought she was gonna jump. She thought They thought she was gonna commit suicide. So they, so they started yelling to her, don't do it, we'll come up and get you. And, uh, and then they realized they could see through her. And they went and got the priests and then all these other people started to gather and they saw her and photographed her. And then she started to appear almost nightly for the next six months. And so as, as a result of that, tens of thousands of people came from all over the world, not just Africa and North Africa, they came from all over the world. And uh, uh, they were able to see her, some were able to see her and some were not able to see her, uh, but they were able to photograph her. So one of the people I spoke to was a, uh, a Harvard uh, uh, theologian who lived there. He worked at the American University in Cairo. And he was a uh, Harvard trained, but he was from Germany. So he would bring a lot of people to Egypt to see this vision. And uh, many of these people couldn't, many, sometimes the most devout people could not see the vision. And sometimes people who were atheists and didn't believe in it at all uh, could see the vision of her. Uh, but there's photographs all over the place of it. I've not been able to find any film, but I don't know they they had great equipment at that point or not. That's interesting because they're still not able to photograph um, the visions in Medjugorje. You know, we don't right. really, I mean, these Marian apparitions have been happening for a very long time, yeah. and they're really picking up speed because are, it's all over the world. And they're, and they can be photographed in Egypt. It's That's just a lot of people can't. A lot of people can't see them for some reason. So you would you would get ten or fifteen people together, and four or five couldn't see her, even though they were in the presence of everyone else who could see her. And she would come sometimes float down off this top of this temple, and in, look at, at the crowd very close, and then go back. So this Where happened people, again. Where can people view these photographs? Oh, well, you, you can go. Actually, I made a film about it. So you can you can go on, on my website if you want to. It's Paul Perry Productions. And uh, go to the, the movie button and click on that. And there's two films there. There's uh, Jesus in Egypt. 
and then there's uh, visions and miracles in Egypt, and both have uh, uh, a, a lot of these. So there's a lot of visions and miracles in Egypt. Well, I, I mean, to go beyond Cairo, when you get into a suit where Joseph saw the angel who told him that they could return to Israel because Herod was dead, there's still visions there to, to this day. And I, and I photographed one. I'll be glad to send it to you when, when this is over. Oh, I so love that. I love it. Yeah. Um, just to, you know, segue a little bit. You've also yeah, right. have, have written, um, <laughs> you know, a dozen books, you know, on NDEs, um, five of them New York Times bestsellers. I'm sure some people in, you know, my audience have, have read some of them. Um, how did you discover the field? Did you have well, an NDE or was just people you knew? It's quite the opposite. I, uh, I was editing, I was living in New York and I was editing uh, a magazine called American Health. And it was the most successful magazine of the 80s actually. And uh, uh, I was executive editor of that magazine. And I got a call from my book agent, Nat Sobel. And I met him for a hamburger for lunch. And, and, and Nat says, uh, uh, I have an author who just can't pull the trigger on a book. He's on, under contract to write this book. He just can't get it going. I said, OK, who is it? He said, proudly, it's Raymond Moody. And I said, I don't know who Raymond Moody is. <laughs> He says, yeah, he's the, the king of who, NDEs. <laughs> I know, yeah, well, like, yeah, he said, he's the guy who uh, first studied near-death experiences and then named it. And I said, I don't know what a near-death experience is. And, and he says, don't you watch Oprah? <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and finally, he says, you know, look, well, here's exactly what he said. He said, for the editor of a major medical magazine, you're not very smart. You need, you need to go help this guy with the book so you can learn something about near-death experiences. And uh, so, you know, that's how Nat talks to me and I, and I bought it. So I went to Georgia and, and met Raymond. And uh, uh, we worked on a book, our first book was called The Light Beyond. And what it was, was Raymond had written Life After Life uh, 10 years earlier. And what the publisher wanted was a book that covered all the research that had been done in those subsequent 10 years. So that's what the light beyond was about. And uh, I, as I started researching and spending time with Raymond, which is a wonderful experience, by the way, uh, he, we got to a section where we started talking about children and near death experiences. And I said, well, is there any research on this? And he said, no, there's no one's done any research except one guy just recently published a, uh, a case study in uh, a journal of pediatrics. But the Ian Stevenson also did a lot of research um, from University of Virginia in India. Well, he did, but he did largely on reincarnation. But I oh, think that's true. Ian, that's true. Yeah, You're right. Focused, yeah. And, and so uh, I went and looked up this pediatrician, a guy named Melvin Morris, and, and I I looked that up and he had, he had started a whole bunch of research projects on children near death experiences in Seattle. So I went there and uh, moved into Seattle for a couple of weeks and, and helped, helped him do research, listened to his stories about children who had had near death experiences and went out and found my own. And then I wrote a proposal for the book called, it was called at the time, children of the light. The book that came out was closer to the light. And, uh, we circulated the proposal to 18 publishers. Uh, 16 of them uh, immediately rejected it. And, and their letters, which I still have, said things like, this is more of a magazine article than a book. Uh, people don't care this much about children. That was another <laughs> one. <laughs> I know. Oh, That's really? a strange comment. <laughs> uh, you know, they didn't have kids themselves. Uh, you know, that, you know, children can't possibly experience these. It went on and on. And we sent it to uh, Diane Reverend, who was at, at the time uh, an editor at HarperCollins. And I'm sitting there on the phone reading all these rejection letters. And Diane is on the phone with me saying, if you handle this right, it's going to be huge. And so, okay. Uh, and we wrote the book and it was immediately huge. Uh, you know, Melvin went on uh, Oprah's show twice 
And uh, it was a bestseller before even that. I mean, people were, it's a great subject. And, and just Wonderful. one of those subjects that people didn't know existed, you know. Yeah. And then after that, every book that I did, uh, I did Transform by the Light about how near-death experiences transform people's lives. And uh, uh, after that book, I said there would be, every book would bring up questions. You know, the, the book about children would bring up questions about, well, how did this change their lives? And how long does the change last? And so we did all these uh, medical studies with a lot, a whole bunch of doctors and uh, on, on transformations. And, uh, and that's what that book is about, Transformed by the Light. And then it just went on and on. Each book posed a question that I was so, in, oh, in, so interested in that I wanted to write another book. And how has all of this changed your view of your life and DEs? Tremendously. Uh, I mean, it's hard not to even read one book and, and be changed by it. Because what it, what it does is it, it near-death experiences open a door to, to another reality. Did it make you and believe it, in the afterlife? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. But then it's convincing other people that an afterlife is true, uh, that, that can be difficult or easy, but generally it's difficult. So do you get a lot of letters from people saying, oh, I've experienced this? Oh, yeah. I get letters. Uh, uh, I wrote a book. Well, you know, Daniel, Daniel Brinkley. I wrote a book with Daniel Brinkley. Oh, and I, I know Daniel. To... <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's I know a character. Well. And uh, I went to his house. He lives in Aiken, North Carolina, South Carolina. And uh, I went there after we wrote Saved by the Light. And uh, he had a room full of full that the post office had just delivered full of boxes full of letters you know now they come in differently they come in as email but yeah i get uh uh you know people telling me their stories constantly uh, yeah it's it's just it's just wonderful because i think it makes people feel validated like this is real yeah. like i'm not making it up you know yes that sort of thing because they can know themselves and then say, you know, as time goes on, yeah, maybe that didn't happen. Maybe I was hallucinating, you know? I mean, I also think what really opened it up was Evan Alexander, because, you know, yeah. here he is going out there on a limb saying, okay, I don't even know what I believed before this, and here I am. So I think it's pretty wonderful sure. that um, it validates, not only does it validate an afterlife, it validates what people, millions of people have sure. experienced. So that's very yeah. cool. You know, the same thing with the shared death experiences. You know, we had on Sharon Prentice and she talked about shared, uh, shared death experiences. Um, you also speak about that. Am I correct? Yeah. Uh, Raymond and I wrote a book. Well, we were writing. OK, I'll tell you, give you the whole backstory. We were writing a different book that is has been published called Paranormal. And it's a kind of a memoir of, of Raymond's uh, uh, life studying near-death experiences and halfway through it we then got back on the subject of shared death experiences it had come up in every single one of our books and uh but there was no book about them and so we got to share death experiences and we were writing you know just a short half chapter or so about them for his memoir and and i just said why don't we just write a book about shared death experiences like do it right now because we had so many of them. And, uh, and so we did, we set the memoir aside and we did this book called Glimpses of Eternity. And uh, that came out, I forget how many years ago, six years ago, something like that, six, seven years ago. And that's a book, it was actually the first book dedicated to shared death experiences. And in that book, we followed sort of the pattern of life after life where we uh, defined a shared death experience and gave uh, examples of them and, and showed how shared death experiences had, they've been in the medical literature for hundreds of years and, and people just really don't notice it. It's funny how many things are like that. Like there's terminal lucidity and, uh, and that's been in the medical uh, uh, venue for hundreds of years. Can you uh, all the way explain back to that? The what terminal lucidity yeah. 
and no one ever picked up on it. But here, here's what terminal lucidity is. And I have some extreme examples, which are the best way to look at this. Uh, some, many people who are on the verge of dying, even people who have no brain waves, uh, will suddenly make a comeback. And, and they'll just wake up. They'll, some, they'll sometimes talk about what they've seen on the other side, or they'll want to be more businesslike, and they'll talk to their family about uh, uh, the, you know, the, the key to the safe, you know, or uh, how they want their, uh, you know, possessions divided, things like that. Or they'll just talk to their family, and everyone thinks they've then come back, and they're no longer sick, and they'll be around for another year or so. But they generally die within the next few hours, and sometimes almost immediately, and that's this moment of lucidity as a person has died uh, and then come back. I hate to say died and then come back, but, but as a person who is expected to die and very far along and they make a return. Some of these have been very extreme. There's uh, uh, records of them from uh, like the 19th century, 18th century of uh, people who, who had meningitis as children and had never been uh, conscious. And then as they die, they become very conscious. And they talk about things that have happened in the institution where they've been institutionalized. Uh, they'll, they'll actually speak poetry. They're called swan songs is what they called them over the years. And, and they'll, they'll deliver long, excellent poems. They become very lucid at it at a point in their life when they should really be dying because they're showing all the signs of dying. They become very lucid and then they'll die in the next few hours. So what do you attribute? So these kids are, you know, they're reciting poetry. How, it's a you, study and I where really are they think learning it's a, that? Where is that coming from? That's a great question. But, but it's also, uh, this is a good way to look at consciousness. And, and the, the big question has always been with near-death experiences, shared death and everything else, the big question has always been, does your consciousness leave your body? Or is your consciousness dependent upon your body? And terminal lucidity is just one of, of many reasons you can say that consciousness is independent of the body. Because it appears as though their consciousness kind of comes out of them. And, and can then address everything that they sh should have addressed all their lives. So consciousness or soul, or are they one and the same? Same thing. It depends on uh, what church you belong to. <laughs> but, you know, consciousness is uh, it's scientific. It's referred to scientifically. Soul yeah. has more of a, a religious connotation. Uh, that, See, and I wish know, that would break down because it's not really It's different. breaking down, but I hear you. I, I mean, it's who we are. I mean, why does it have to belong to be stuck in a church or a temple? That's not what it's about. No, it's not. In fact, a lot of people who have near-death experiences are atheists. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people who have shared death experiences are the same. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so a soul is a soul. A soul is consciousness. Have but, you ever had an NDE or an SDE? I've had a shared death experience, and uh, it was quite interesting, actually. Uh, my mother was dying, and uh, it's kind of a roundabout shared death experience, actually, but my mother was dying, and she had Alzheimer's. And uh, one day, I got a phone call from uh, uh, Vernon Neppe. Vernon Neppe was the head of uh, uh, neuropharmacology at the University of Washington. And he and I had worked on a project about five years earlier. And then I had not talked to Vernon in five years. And I got a call from him while my mother's in the hospital. And he says, I was reading the paper this morning and uh, a voice told me to call Paul Perry. And this, this is an MD, PhD, okay. And he's a scientist. <laughs> And he says, so I ignored the voice. And uh, about five minutes later, still reading the paper, the voice said, call Paul Perry. 
So I don't know why I'm calling you, but I'm calling. And and I said, wow, that's you know, it's kind of weird, Vern, because I, you know, my mother's dying of of uh, what they described as a rapid onset Alzheimer's, and uh, you know, I think she's going to die. And he said, well, he said, okay, I have some experience with that, and and he started telling me what he had done with elderly people who had had that experience of you know rapid onsite Alzheimer's. He said that he had he had started doing electroshock therapy with them, and he he said you know we did that because there was no other thing we could test, there was no other medicine that was working, so we did that with a few of these people, and he said it was like it reset their brain, that they popped out of it and they weren't a hundred percent, but they were pretty good, and he said they lived for you know several more years and. Uh, uh, why don't you talk to someone about trying that? And so I spoke to her doctor. Well, actually, I was talking to Vernon. I was taking notes. And this is back in the day before iPhones. The phone that was clicking, and it kept saying, you know, uh, you know, message waiting, essentially. So I said, Vernon, I've got to get this call. So I answered it, and it was the, uh, uh, the home where my mom was saying that she had passed away. So somehow this got communicated uh, to Vern. I have no idea how else it could have happened otherwise. And, yeah, that's uh, interesting. Yeah, so that's a shared death experience. So can you tell us the different kinds of shared death experiences? There, there, it's not just one definition, correct? There, well, there is, well, there is one definition. The definition is, is that one when a person who is dying shares their death experience with at least one other person. Okay, but there's several different types. I'm gonna look at my notes here to make sure I get everything right. But there's, there's several different types. There's terminal lucidity, which we just covered. There's a, a, there's actually, well, out of body experiences can be that. Let me give you an example of that. We, we had a woman years ago, Raymond and I had a, a woman named Vi Horton who uh, had a heart attack. And, you know, she, she lived in Georgia. She had a heart attack. Her kids were in, uh, I think, elementary school, late elementary school. And she goes to the hospital. She's uh, in surgery and she leaves her body. Okay, so that's common with a near-death experience. What isn't common is what happened next, is that she left the surgical arena and went out into the hallway. And she heard her brother-in-law on the phone and he was dressed for golf. And he was saying, uh, it's a, it was a pay phone. He was, he was saying to the person he was talking to, I can't, can't play golf this morning. Vi's about to kick the bucket. And she heard that, <laughs> yeah, touching. <laughs> How sweet, and you're uh, dying. Yeah. Such she goes into she goes into another part of the room and she sees her daughters sitting there and they're dressed in mix mix matched plaids. So you know, one has a red top and a green bottom and vice versa. And uh, uh, then she went into other parts of the hospital and was able, you know, to see what was going on. She then, when she, when she came out of surgery, she told the doctors what she had seen. She told her family what she, what she had seen, her brother-in-law what he had said, and it was all correct. Now, now that's a shared death experience. And the now nice thing that about- shared and not, oh, because it's not near death because she didn't go into the light or do anything like that. Right, she did go into the light actually. But who did she, but, but, but nobody else, Nobody else saw what she saw. But that's true. But she was a. But she was able to describe what they had said. Okay. And what she what she had seen and how they were dressed, which meant that something, her consciousness, her soul, had left her body, and had traveled. So that's that's a form of shared death experience. I know it's kind of so a it's a little different. bit different. Like when Sharon, Prentice had her shared right. death experience, she kind of went as her husband was dying, she kind of went with him, kind of, you know? That's a, that's, that's a shared death experience as well. And uh, 
the best of those would be if she was able to if the best of those would be if they if she if, if her mother or if the person dying came back and could say i had this this and this happen and right. the validate people it. who witnessed it could validate it yeah yeah but that's not the case usually usually that's it's not a, the case uh, yeah that's pretty fascinating usually, that's pretty fascinating because they tend to go all the way you know uh, people oftentimes they're dying and, and a person sees it and they, the person who's dying doesn't come back. So you mm -hmm. can't validate it, but there's many cases where they do come back and the experience can be validated. Yeah. That's but there's another, there's okay. other versions of that as well, where, uh, another type of shared death experience would be a precognitive vision where if say if you woke up in the middle of the night and uh, you saw somebody who had died standing at the foot of your bed and they weren't expected to die. There's a number of those and they're at the foot of your bed and they're either speaking to you or they're just standing there, uh, which has to be one creepy experience. But, and then when you get up in the morning and you say, well, you know, uncle Joe was at the foot of my bed last night. And then you find out later that uncle Joe died. That's a shared death experience because I Uncle hear Joe, a number of those from my clients. They're very common. Uh, we I, I, years ago, I went to San Diego and interviewed a woman named Olga Gerhardt, and she was uh, uh, Spanish. She had a really large uh, Spanish family, and uh, they're all very tight knit. So she had she had a heart problem, and she had to go in to get a heart transplant. And when her time came to get that. She went to the hospital and the whole family went as well in the waiting room, except one guy, and that was her son-in-law. And he couldn't stand to be in, in hospitals. So he'd stayed home. And uh, in the middle of the night, about two in the morning, they had transplanted her heart, but they couldn't get it started. It was erratic and it was not starting. They had to keep working on it, working on it, working on it. And, uh, uh, they come. They came out and they told the family that she was in bad shape, that she might die, but we're going to keep working. Meanwhile, at home, uh, her son-in-law is asleep, and he wakes up, and Olga's standing at the foot of his bed, and and she says, uh, every, "Everything's going to be okay. You know, everything's going to be fine." And I, she said more than that, but I don't remember what it was. So. He calls his wife at about three or four that morning and says, you know, I just saw your mom at the foot of the bed. And she says, everything's going to be okay. And then the doctor comes out and, and says, you know, we got our heart started and all is well. Uh, that's a shared death experience. That's, and yeah, that's, that's, a, that's interesting. That's a, that's a confirmable shared death experience. Well, you and what, a, go ahead. I'm go ahead. sorry. I was going to say what's important about the confirmable aspect is, is that a near-death experience is a subjective experience, meaning it happens only to one person, and only they really experience that. So that makes it subjective. And uh, a shared death experience is objective. It's where uh, one person is dying, and that experience is shared by other people. And if you're lucky, there's a way to confirm it. And that makes it a, an objective experience and, and better proof of separation of consciousness from the body. I'm, I'm just, to me, this is so fascinating. But what, okay, so you brought up transplants. This is yeah. like kind of from left field, but somebody yeah. has a heart transplant and the person is obviously passed who gave up the heart. Can right. they right. have a shared death experience given that they have that person's organ? Well, we do hear those, uh, and I think that'll be a field of study in the future. They they have kind of poo-pooed that, if you will, early on, but now there's more and more stories about people who share the, the traits and the thoughts of that person who gave them the, let's say, the heart. Uh, so that'll be a field for, for more stringent research, but, but they come up now as artifacts, yeah. Well, that would be... Yeah. Yeah, that would be. Yeah, nice. that's cool. You know, 
I think it's just wonderful how people now are not afraid to read about this, to delve yeah, right. into it. You know, like me, you know, I deal with once they pass. So I'm dealing with the souls. You know, I'm not right. dealing with NDEs or, for the most part, not share death experiences. But this is a whole nother book, chapter in our lives as human beings to open up and say, hey, this really happens. And there's more and more um, being talked about. Where do you see this going? Is, can it go anywhere? Or can, it, can it blossom into something else that we all need oh, yeah. to know? Absolutely. I mean, the goal, the goal in this is, is essentially a consciousness goal. People can't really define consciousness. And if you think about it, you really can't define your own consciousness. You know, you can say, well, I think, therefore, I am. Uh, and that's about as good as it gets, you know. So where consciousness comes from isn't really known. Uh, and what consciousness is isn't really known. It just is. So this is a deeper research into consciousness. And, uh, you know, possibly separating consciousness from, from the body for for. God only knows what kind of uses, uh, positive ones, I hope. Uh, but it's also just to understand the human mind better and better. Yeah, but then you know, you so it'll go, question, it'll go that way. Human mind. You know, we can go in circles. Like, where does that exist? You know, yeah, know. In our, it, is it in our head? Is it in our consciousness? And if our consciousness is our soul, you know, I mean, I find that when people pass on, they, pa I mean, it's their, con they come through with personality. So they come sure. through with the essence of who they were, which is their soul. You know, even when I wrote conversations with Mary and I asked her, as she mm -hmm. was explaining it to me, it was like, this hurts my head. You know, because yeah. it's so right. above and beyond what our grasp, our conceptualization as human beings. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I bought, I've bought 20 books in the last year on consciousness. Uh, some of them really dense and others less so. And not only do I not know what consciousness is, but those guys don't know, no. you know, people have studied it. So that's one, that's one of the great mysteries. Yeah, uh, but I think that if we simplify it and just say consciousness is the soul, and then they get into the discussion of what is the soul, you know, it's like when my kids sure. would ask me who created God, it's like, I know. I don't know. You, <laughs> I, what's the round question? That, how do you make something out of nothing yeah i mean if, if the universe was nothing how did it become something that's right you know, yeah and these are know, like the kind person. of things i talk about with raymond moody because he's so philosophical yeah. and then i walk right. away saying i still don't know <laughs> and i know yeah you know that's why it's, it's really interesting um and so you wrote a book called glimpses of eternity yeah, glimpses of eternity. If people want that, they need to go on glimpsesofeternity.com. So tell us the tell us where people can go to um, find your stuff, so to speak. Well, uh, we, Raymond and I have kind of a combined bookstore, and that's they can find uh, they can go to lifeafterlife.com. There's a bookstore there. They can go to uh, Paul Perry Productions. And there's books and films there or glimpses of eternity.com. And there's books and films there as well. I did a really great, it, I did a great documentary on Raymond uh, just called The Light Beyond. And it's nothing but nine, a 90 minute interview with Raymond about all the subjects that he's researched in his life. It's very, very good. Yeah, Raymond's so brilliant. Oh, and he's so nice. Yeah, he's supposed nice to be a book, yeah. Um, yeah. Can they also get your books on Amazon? Yes, yeah, they're all available on Amazon. Films oh. too. Yeah. You are just, you've been delightful. Um, I find, well, thank you, it's great to be here. Yeah, I find the information that, you know, you shared with us to be enlightening and, and I hope people think about it. And, you know, maybe they will recognize that they had a shared death experience and yeah. they didn't know what to call it. Yeah. Um, and so thank you very much for being on the show today. And thank you for having me. I appreciate uh, it. 
You're very welcome. And thank you, all of you out there, for listening in. I hope that you did learn something from it and you do pick up Paul's books and watch his films because I think this is something that is becoming less and less unique but he brings it forward in such a wonderful and beautiful way that you'll be able to integrate it into yourselves, into your souls um, as you go through your life. And so once again, thank you for joining in. Um, please check me out at anaraymondi.com and I look forward to the next time we meet again. Be well. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye.